The Thameslink route forms one of the most important parts of the UK's railway infrastructure, running over parts of existing main lines and some of the first railway lines ever constructed in the capital. It's been part of one of the biggest new build railway engineering projects since the Victorian age. Here we look at the history, the routes, motive power and more as we take a look at 101 facts about Thameslink. This video also owes a huge depth of thanks to two fellow channels who very kindly provided permission for use of some footage. These are the brilliant Boom Train Spots and the sensational To The Trains channels. Make sure you visit them after watching this video and subscribe to them for some more excellent factual rail based content. The Thameslink route is controlled by the Govia Thameslink Railway Company. It currently serves around 115 stations across London and further afield. Much of the original route travels over the Brighton Main Line via London Bridge. It also travels over the southern part of the Midland Main Line from Bedford via Luton. Along with its key start and end points at Bedford and Brighton, services from Peterborough and Cambridge also pass through key interchanges within central London to the likes of Raynham and Horsham among others. It's the only service of its kind that runs through the City of London rather than solely terminating within the capital. This unique through service that we know today opened in 1980. 88. The links with the East Coast Main Line via Peterborough and Cambridge were completed by 2018, in addition to the Arun Valley Line running from Horsham and the Greenwich and North Kent Lines via Raynham. There's also a suburban loop passing through Sutton and Wimbledon. The line's principal motive power comes in the form of the DeZero City Class 700, which we'll cover in more detail during this video. The service's reporting mark is designated as TL. Thameslink's northernmost calling point is Peterborough, which also acts as an interchange for Great Northern services, which are also part of the Govia Thameslink Railway Company banner. Its most easterly calling point is Gillingham down in Kent. Its westernmost calling point is Horsham Station in West Sussex, and Thameslink trains can be found as far south as Little Hampton Station, though this is only called that during peak times. Now let's look at the line's origins. These can be traced as far back as the 1860s when the London, Chatham and Dover Railway opened its extension across the River Thames. The extension travelled north along a viaduct at Blackfriars and through a new tunnel at Snow Hill to Farringdon Station. This link allowed the LC and DR to connect with the Metropolitan Railway and onwards to King's Cross and St Pancras. Three stations were built along this route at Snow Hill, Holborn Viaduct and Ludgate Hill. All three of these have now disappeared through closure or redevelopment and for many years a north to south rail link through the city had been cut off. However, this would be rectified when work began to reinstate the link in 1986. The trains would follow the same route as the original LC and DR trains, though the viaduct at Ludgate Hill was demolished and trains instead ran through a newly constructed tunnel. Holborn Viaduct Station was demolished in 1990 to make way for a new station nearby called City Thameslink, which opened on the 20th 29th of May 1990. As a direct result of the scheme, journeys between destinations in North and South London quadrupled after the first year of operation. By 1998, it was carrying more than 28,000 passengers on average during the morning peak, which led to some severe overcrowding and calls for improvements to be made. This saw the direct birth of the Thameslink program scheme to aid increased capacity along the route. We'll cover the specifics of the programme in more detail shortly. One of the major improvements of the programme saw the introduction of brand new rolling stock, which brings us back to the Class 700s. They are part of the Zero City family of trains. 115 of these units were built between 2014 and 2018. The first completed unit was delivered in July 2015. They come in two formations. First, the 700 Zero series are formed of eight car sets, while the 701 series come in 12 car sets. 60 of the eight car sets are in service, along with 55 of the 12 car sets. They were all constructed by the Siemens Mobility Works in Krefeld, Germany. Today, the fleet is maintained at the Hornsey and Three Bridges depots. The first of these brand new trains entered service for the first time in 2016. After replacing other classes, they are currently the only type of motive power ran by Thameslink. The oldest class they replaced were the Class 319s, which originally came into service in the late 1980s, primarily built for use on the Thameslink services. 86 of these units were built, and although they no longer work on the Thameslink route, the majority of units were redeployed to other parts of the UK network, including the north of England. Class 377s and 387s also ran along the route for a short time, while the initial batch of Class 700s were delayed in entering service. Most of these units are still on the Govia Thameslink Railway Company's books, 
and can be seen on the network under the company's other brands. The Class 700s run on both third rail and overhead electrified lines. Their top speed is up to 100 miles per hour. The continuous gangway is one of the key features of their design, allowing for one of the Thameslink program's key aims in increasing train capacity. The eight car sets accommodate 427 seats with a standing capacity of 719 passengers. The 12 car sets accommodate 666 seats along with a standing capacity of 1,088 passengers. The eight car sets weigh 274 long tons or 306 short tons, while the 12 car sets weigh 400 long tons or 400 450 short tons. Some of their similar looking EMU siblings include the Southwestern Railway's Class 707s. Some of these will soon come into service with Southeastern, a company which shares many of the same routes as Thameslink. Click on the link above to check out 101 facts about Southeastern for more information. There are also the Class 717 units. These also come under the Govia Thameslink Railway Company's portfolio running under the Great Northern franchise. As mentioned previously, the new rolling stock came as part of the huge Thameslink program. This program has cost an estimated £6 billion in total. It was first proposed in the 1990s following the increase in passenger numbers along the route. Following a few delays, permission for the program was finally granted in 2006. With government funding approved by 2007, work started in earnest in 2009 and continues into the present day. The program would be divided into several key outputs. The first, designated Key Output Zero, actually involved adjusted service changes and even some closures. These consisted of the terminal platforms at London Blackfriars Station, plus the closure of the Farringdon to Moorgate branch. A key reason for this was alterations to the signalling and also the track and overhead wiring equipment to allow merged services to operate, allowing the running of dual-powered rolling stock. The final part of Key Output Zero and the beginning of Key Output One saw the complete remodelling of Farringdon Station by 2011. This meant Farringdon could now accommodate longer trains and an increased capacity of 150,000 daily passengers. Key Output 1 was effectively completed by mid-2012 in time for the Olympic Games. One of the major goals met during this phase was the enabling of 12 carriage trains to run on the Bedford to Brighton route. 23 stations along the Bedford to Brighton route were extended to accommodate the longer trains, while Farringdon and Blackfriars were rebuilt to allow for 12 car trains and increased passenger flows. The work at Blackfriars also utilised part of the disused abutments of the adjacent bridge, which also used to carry trains over the River Thames. You can still see some of them today quite clearly from the south side of the river. A huge part of the programme included the installation of a new viaduct over Borough Market and the Borough High Streets. Open to traffic in 2016, this allowed for dedicated routes for trains travelling to Blackfriars and southeastern services heading to Charing Cross. Its installation in turn saw double the number of tracks heading west from London Bridge Station. London Bridge Station itself is one of the major components of the Thameslink route and the Thameslink programme, with programme works starting in May 2013. Almost the entire station has been modified, with three new through platforms introduced, existing platforms rebuilt to accommodate longer trains, a much bigger concourse and a new station entrance. That's without even covering the extensive alterations to the track layout and the installation of new signalling. By 2020, the Thameslink lines through London Bridge were one of the only locations on the UK rail network to use a digital signalling system. The station was officially reopened on the 9th of May 2018. Today, Thameslink trains call at platforms 4 and 5 between the Brighton Main Line and the Thameslink core via Blackfriars. Pre-pandemic, Thameslink would bear the fruits of a portion of over 60 million passengers at London Bridge Station each year. Just down the line from London Bridge, another major engineering feat was accomplished in 2016, the completion of the new Bermondsey Dive Under, a new junction that enables dedicated lines to and from London Bridge. It's located quite close to the Millwall Football Club Stadium, just a little further south from London Bridge. Another notable station in the Thameslink property portfolio comes under St Pancras International Station, allowing commuters access to the international Eurostar services and connections to the Southeastern's domestic high-speed one, Javelin services. 
This connection to St Pancras via Peterborough and Cambridge makes use of the so-called canal tunnels. These tunnels were built from 2004, allowing East Coast mainline trains to connect with the low-level St Pancras station rather than at King's Cross. The total length of the tunnels are 820 metres. More work at a major Thameslink interchange came in the form of improvements to City Thameslink station in 2010. The platforms here were increased ready for the arrival of the new 12-car trains. Other improvements included new ticket gates, CCTV cameras and passenger information systems. Trains through City Thameslink run from Monday to Saturday, though curiously not on Sundays. Four trains per hour call through here to the likes of Brighton, Bedford and St Albans City, while two trains per hour call through on route to the likes of Luton, Horsham, Raynham, Cambridge and Peterborough among others. A quirky fact about City Thameslink Station is that it actually serves as the lost property office of the Thameslink service. Now you know where to call if you make the mistake of leaving any luggage behind. One of the busiest stations along the route is Gatwick Airport Station on the main line to Brighton, serving over 20 million passengers each year. I'm sure you can guess why. Three of the franchises owned by the Govia Thameslink Railway Company call here, with Thameslink, Southern and Gatwick Express trains all running into the station, making it a real stronghold for the parent company. Of course, it's not the only major airport served by Thameslink trains, with trains also calling at Luton Airport Parkway. This is one of the more recently opened stations on the route, built in 1999 to serve the adjacent airport. Venturing back further south down the route, during peak hours it's actually possible to travel to East Grinstead Station in West Sussex. This allows you to potentially alight from a brand new Class 700 train and onto the connecting Bluebell Steam Railway. Another preserved railway nearby the Thameslink route is the Neen Valley Railway at Peterborough, which also has a physical connection to Network Rail, though this connection isn't actually at Peterborough Station, and if you want to visit the NVR, you'll have to walk from Peterborough Mainline Station to the preserved station if you want to visit the line. The key southern terminus of the route is of course Brighton, where today Thameslink shares the load of just shy of 20 million passengers each year. Today, Brighton's Grade 2 listed station boasts eight platforms, all of which are capable of running 12-car trains. The two platforms predominantly used by Thameslink services are from platforms 5 and 6 towards Cambridge and Bedford, respectively. Another point of interest along the Thameslink route includes part of the original London and Greenwich Railway, which was the first steam railway ever opened in the capital. Today, it shares this section of line with trains from Southeastern, frequently passing the likes of Class 465s and 376s. As of 2020, Thameslink Link is featured once again on the Tube map. It previously hadn't been seen on the map for 22 years. Click the link in the description for Jeff Marshall's excellent breakdown on the history of Thameslink and its relationship with the Tube map. So what does the future of Thameslink look like? Well, one implementation concerns the signalling and the implementation of automatic train operation. This will allow trains to operate with a tube-like frequency of every two to three minutes across the central London belt. While the main Thameslink program itself is mostly complete, improvements continue to be made. For example, at the seemingly never finished London Bridge Station with facilities still being updated. There's also the possibility of a new Thameslink 2 line being constructed. The Independent Rail Future organisation is campaigning for a new link connecting the Brighton Main Line to routes via the likes of Canary Wharf and Stratford to the east. Quite a prospect. Thameslink's YouTube channel has 623 subscribers. Their Facebook page is followed by over 6,300 people. Its Twitter page has over 80,000 followers and just under 3,000 followers on Instagram. For more information about Thameslink, you can visit thameslinkrailway.com and for more information about the Thameslink project, you can go to thameslinkprogram.co.uk. I hope you enjoyed this video featuring 101 facts about Thameslink. If you found it interesting, then please hit us with a thumbs up, leave a comment and click subscribe for more weekly rail-based content just like this. Thanks for watching and see you soon. Bye for now.